It's that time of year again when summer fades away and the nights get longer. We are now well into the spooky season with Halloween right around the corner. Welcome to another episode of Remnant Stew. I'm Leah. I'm Phil. And I'm Steve. Join us today as we begin our Fractured Fall Festival of Fun. This is Season 5, Episode 17, Eerie. If you have an appetite for the strange and bizarre, then pull up a chair and grab a spoon for another intriguing serving of Remnant Stew. Remnant Stew is gluten-free, organic, made from all natural, free-range ingredients and guaranteed to provide the recommended daily serving of curiosity. I'd rather type Fractured Fall Festival of Fun like as the, the title of it. <laughs> no. Uh, fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is my absolute favorite time of year where uh, these unbearably hot and humid summers just kind of uh, start to die off and we get a break from the high temperatures. We would think it was still 94 today. <laughs> but, right? it, but it's better In the middle than, of October, it's still 94. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Uh, but it's a time of year that I miss my home state of Kentucky, most of all, where I'm from. There's actual autumn with leaves oh, turning yeah. and and uh, falling and the crisp bite in the air. And we don't quite get that here in the south. And I, man, I miss <laughs> it. I really miss it. We don't get chilly weather until late, late November, early December. Sometimes. But we do get a break. From the ninety to hundred degree weather. Yeah, it's either summer it. or yeah. or or really hot summer. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, first summer, second summer. Yeah. Or, my favorite month used to be October until moving here. Now I think it's November. Yeah, November. I, we know how to do November pretty well here. Yeah, in and, and I love Thanksgiving, and I yeah. love the time you can enjoy being outside without re- risking heat stroke or hypothermia. <laughs> yes. But October is the official spooky season month, so it's still one of my top favorites. So in the spirit of October and upcoming Halloween, we're bringing you stories today that are eerie and spooky. We'll be talking about some crazy Halloween laws, wild deathbed confessions, and other eerie stories. Now, this is a topic that we have touched on before. And so as we're nearing the end of October, you also might want to go back and listen to these previous episodes to help you get into that eerie mood. Season 1, Episode 7 was called Spooky. We talked about an ancient castle built to keep things in. That's right. A death whistle, lost children, and a prophetic dream. These are just some of the spooky things that we explored in that episode. Then in Season 2, Episode 2, Superstition, uh, from talisman, amulets, and salt thrown over the shoulder. Superstitions will have you knocking on wood. Seems like we talked about baseball players in that episode. Yeah, a lot we really did. <laughs> they are extraordinarily superstitious. Then season two, episode 23, was Curiously Interred. Yeah, this is the episode that we uh, explored weird burial customs, odd gravestones, and those who were curiously interred. That's a really interesting story there. And then season three, episode 23, was just called Creepy, (laughs) as as in Wally and Beaver's favorite way to describe that girl that was looking at you all through lunch. Oh, Beaver, she was really creepy. (laughs) These stories included strange deaths, broomsticks, and Halloween in Japan. So you don't want to go back and if you don't want to miss that one, go back and take a listen to those episodes. <laughs> okay. Well, like we mentioned, Halloween is coming up. Is what are y'all's memories? Because I I experienced Halloween in Kentucky. Right. So. Yeah, well, we, Sam is in the studio today, so I get. To oh man, yeah, he <laughs> is going to talk <laughs> childhood stories. So. Uh, growing up as one of three boys before our lovely little sister was uh, born into the family, we we had a complex relationship with birthdays. It was very hard oh. to get together and celebrate for <laughs> that many birthdays throughout the year. Uh, and so I remember one year we opted to do a big Halloween bash and kind of combine all of our birthdays. What he's not saying is that we were too poor to do <laughs> or I was too now, frugal. You, you, you didn't tell them that at the time. So. Right. Well, it didn't feel that way because that Halloween oh. bash was huge. I mean, we had a big blow up, you know, blow castle. Uh, what do you call that? Bouncy house. We had yeah. a bouncy house. We did, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, bobbing for apples, things like that. So. And that I cleaned really... Joe's blood out of that bouncy house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. Mom also had a Kids Bop Halloween album uh-huh. that was on repeat for the entirety of October and probably a good portion of November. <laughs> and so we got real sick and tired of that one. But uh, those are some of the things that really bring me back to Halloween in this time of year. 
What about you guys? I remember, you know, trick or treating in my neighborhood, which was kind of rural, so you had to kind of go far from house to house. <laughs> but then uh, there was the school always had a carnival, a Halloween carnival in those days, my elementary school. And so, I can, okay, I remember I was in my costume, had my mask on. And uh, my second grade teacher was giving out tickets to this one little booth, and I stuck my tongue out at her behind my mask. You know, I thought it was really. <laughs> you were slick. <laughs> she didn't know it was me, and uh, she didn't see me sticking my tongue out, but I remember doing that. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, mercy. Oh, no, we but just trick or treated. It was just like trick or treated. Just, we get together and just uh, walk the neighborhood because it was a neighborhood. Uh, I do remember going with some a uh, friend of mine with our daughters were the same age and he brought a backpack and he said, you got to bring a, an empty backpack. I was like, what for? We got about halfway through his neighborhood, emptied the kids bag, their bags into the backpack. By the time we got back to the house, those backpacks were full. Oh, wow. oh my goodness. Like your school jams, you know, backpacks. Yeah. Oh yeah. It mm-hmm. was full. And then they still had whatever they had on them. Golly. Well, (laughs) something you said, Dr. Meeker, I wanted to make a quick shout out as well, because we also lived in a neighborhood that was a little, you know, further apart, spread out. And we were really the only kids on the block. But the neighborhood came together every year and always had something great for us. Uh, I remember Miss Judy up the road would always get out huge candy bars and make (laughs) popcorn balls and stuff. And so they really made it special for the only kids on the block. That's right. I kept joking that they all needed to buy one bag of candy between all of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, I remember one other thing. When I was a teenager, a bunch of friends of mine, we had a Halloween uh, carnival. And um, somehow somebody found out that there was a local funeral home in town that had this extra casket oh, laying around. Nice. <laughs> and um, I think it, somebody had died in South America and they had shipped the body back in this casket. But it was it was uh, not quite up to standards that most people wanted. And so they the family got a different casket to bury them. And so then they had this old casket there and we borrowed it for our party. And uh, the next day I remember driving it back through town in the back of my pickup truck. And I thought I was really cool. You know, (laughs) I am a hearse. (laughs) Now my wife, Judy is with us in the studio today. Do you have a, uh, she grew up in Yankee land up in Ohio. So yeah. Um, Yes, I remember going out, and I my mother had gotten me a plastic um, red devil suit, <laughs> and <laughs> I think I must have been six, seven years old. You could go out at that time by yourself, so I went out, and I had my little bag, and I had it all full, and some creepy kids stole it, and they, you know, they jerked it out of my hand and ran away, and so I was crying, and I went back home to my mother, and she goes, go out there again and just keep going. Go get some more. <laughs> go get some more. So anyway, she gave me another bag. And Not a lot of sympathy in those yeah, days. No. <laughs> that, that's yeah. all right. Yeah, it was fun. Good well, time. there are a lot of a lot of hijinks on Halloween. A lot of kids get out of get ru- unruly and out of uh, out of control. Right. So. Some places have rules about trick or treating. Yeah. Wait, Ooh. what? That's they have right. rules? They have, yeah, some places do. From a British website called the University of Law, we found an interesting article about Halloween laws. Right. And in the state of Alabama, it's illegal to dress up as a priest or a nun for Halloween. <laughs> in a in a really long <laughs> I'm so run on stuck. Wait. What? A priest or a nun? A priest or a nun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything Illegal. else goes, but no priest, no nuns. In Alabama. Demons yeah. are well, fine. Well, yeah. not quite, not <laughs> Evil spirits are perfectly fine, but no, <laughs> no priest. Well, well, listen to the, the wording. No exorcisms or anything like that? Really Read it to us from wording. the state code of Alabama there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so quote, whoever being in a public place fraudulently pretends by garb or outward array to be a minister of any religion or nun, priest, rabbi, or another member of the clergy is guilty of a misdemeanor and upon conviction shall be punished by a fine not exceeding $500 <laughs> or confinement in the county j- yeah, the county jail for not more than one year or both. <laughs> Holy cow. Such Both. fine and imprisonment. They're so serious you... in Alabama. They don't want you dressing up like a clergy person. Do yeah, do they consider that stolen valor? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? But my goodness, like a year. In... <laughs> well, back in 2017, several communities were complaining of rogue clown attacks. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> These were not actually professional clowns, mind you, because we respect those. Uh, but ordinary troublemakers in clown garb. 
Well, the people in the French village of Vroudragi made it illegal for anyone to dress as a clown for Halloween or for the entire month of November. You did a good job of that pronunciation, by the way. <laughs> I, I just I just went right through it thinking, yeah, I'm just... <laughs> We're just going to butcher it anyway, so why even... Just do it confidently, right? right? <laughs> well, I can pronounce this one. In the town of Belleville, Missouri, you can't ask for candy on Halloween if you have passed the eighth grade or the grade of an eighth grader, usually 13, 14 years old, enforcing the opinion that trick-or-treating is for children only. And in Chesapeake, Virginia, you must be 12 or younger. Yeah, and, I've seen some people pushing that. You know, I've seen some high school kids coming by my Dude, mind. I serve the high school kids <laughs> for this. I mean, it's like they're coming through, usually walking their 12-year-old, 12 and under kids. It's yeah. like, I don't no, know. you deserve I'm candy. Hopefully not their 12 and younger kids. Well, maybe they're 12 yeah. maybe I'm they're not going to specify that. They say, but they're, they still got their bag. Some, some kids bring their pillowcase around, you know. Right? Yeah, that's true. I'm just feeling like if they're out there trick-or-treating, just be At safe. least they're walking yeah. the neighborhood. That's right. And, yeah. and not being... Mischievous. You know, mischievous. Yes. Extra mischievous. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is, a, this is a hard to pronounce one. In Reho- Rehoboth, uh-huh. Rehoboth, Delaware, I think that's how you say it, right. it's illegal to celebrate Halloween on Halloween Day if October 31st falls on a Sunday. Oh. <laughs> the coastal town has prohibited celebration in the, of the occasion on Sundays, meaning all festivities must take place on October 30th. Okay. And further restrictions limit any trick-or-treating to be carried out between the hours of 6 and 8 p.m. Yeah. So you got you just got a time You got two hours. That's two it. hours. And break the law, and you could be fined up to $150. Ooh, wow. That's hey, just, at least it's not stiff. a year in jail. <laughs> that's right. There's no jail time for that one. Now, in Hollywood, you hear that anything goes, right? Yeah. Well, not quite. The use, sale, possession, or even distribution of silly string. Silly string. Is prohibited in Hollywood, California from 12 a.m. on October 31st until 12 p.m. on November 1st. That's, that's the sale. <laughs> the yeah. sale or the, or the holding possession. it, having it. You can't, it. Even, have it. It. You can't yeah. even have it on you. Yeah. No. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was just wanting to be clear because yeah, it's look, like, look, look at the it's fine. just going There's for the fine. sale? All right, fine. And the okay. fine for oh, no. that... Is up to a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars, yeah, Jeez. for silly string. So, so you know that there were some people that led to that decision. Being no, <laughs> yeah. I, I gotta wonder what led to that. I mean, what kind? Of, what, what happened in Hollywood that they were so upset about silly string? It clogged up somebody's something. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it's the silly string massacre. Somebody's swimming. Well, pool, and maybe. maybe it's really hard to clean up if you yeah. use like tons of. I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, I, don't know. I guess. In Forsyth, Illinois, visitors can only approach houses with exterior lights on, or they face a fine up to seven hundred and fifty dollars. Wow! Many towns have stated hours at trick or treating can occur. In Newport News, Virginia, or Bathurst, New Brunswick, in Canada, the hours are set between six and eight p.m. Fines can be levied for those caught out after eight p.m. Hmm. So they're just like wow. <laughs> but you know, I mean, they don't do it for just because you know yeah. somebody had to lead to that. And the country of Jordan has made Halloween and its celebrations illegal. You can't celebrate or attend Halloween celebrations. Not in, in the country of Jordan. Okay. Yeah. No, no Halloween for you. In 2015, the U.S. Embassy in Jordan warned, quote, the U.S. Embassy advises that U.S. citizens traveling from their home to a Halloween party or vice versa cover up their co- costumes while in public or in a car. <laughs> just to <laughs> make go sure. to your party incognito. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and uncover when you get there. Uh, those are Bam! Some here I laws. am. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, now on to another kind of an eerie story. I wonder if you've ever heard of a woman named Marie Groschultz, G R O S H O L T Z. You ever heard of her? I think in high school we probably would have been mean about her name had we heard of her, but no, we had not. Well, you probably haven't heard that name, but you may have heard of her more famous professional name. Oh, but I'm going to go after uh, one of our inspirations here, like uh, Mike Rowe, and just tell you about them and see if you can figure out who it is. Well, I'm going to do the Mike Rowe jingle. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so Marie came from an interesting family. She grew up in France in the late 1700s, and several, several of her relatives were professional executioners, which was a pretty good occupation to have during the French Revolution. <laughs> her widowed mother worked for a gentleman named Philip Curtius, C-U-R-T-I-U-S, who was a well-known artist and wax maker. He used wax in his artistic medium. And this was an era when the forming of wax facial masks was a popular way of replicating a person's likeness. 
Of course, death masks were common, but living persons also had facial recreations done for themselves. Wax heads mounted on costumed mannequin, bo uh, mannequin bodies became a sort of a real-time political commentary for Parisians in salons like those of Curtius. Um, as Marie grew, she would assist Mr. Curtius in his work, and she became very skilled at it herself. When the French Revolution began in 1789, the wax mask business was brisk. Marie was not exactly the kind of girl who dreamed of white lace and piano lessons. Instead, she honed her skill making death masks from the guillotined heads during the French Revolution. Oh, my. <laughs> Innovative. Oh. Yes. Her skill brought her in contact with people in high position as well as brutal criminals. The work required equal comfort in palaces and in prisons and a certain ease with the grotesque. She later wrote that she sat, quote, on the steps of the exhibition with a bloody head on her knees taking the impressions of their features. Among the most famous of her impressions is that of Marie Antoinette immediately following her beheading. Success in waxworks involved not only artistic skill and patience, but an ear to the ground and fast feet. When Charlotte Corday murdered the radical Jean-Paul Marat in his bathtub, Marie got the scene so fast that the killer was still being processed by law enforcement. She started to work on Marat's death masks as his body still lay in the tub. Oh, wow. Barely, barely hadn't he cooled off yet. She was already making his death mask. Well, by 1802, at age 40, Marie was married with two children. Her no-good husband appeared to have only one skill, and that was spending her money, so she packed up her two sons and slipped out of, the, out of uh, France and went to England. She carried along with her a couple of trunks filled with her collection of death masks and wax moldings. With these in tow, Marie developed a traveling exhibition showcasing her images of the famous and infamous alike. Her traveling show became wildly popular in England. Her popularity enabled her to enlarge her collection as anybody who was anybody was getting their likeness recreated with Marie's mass molds. Lords, ladies, noblemen, and even royalty came to Marie to get waxed. <laughs> In 1835, at the age of 74, Marie stopped the traveling show and set up a permanent location in Baker Street in London. The Baker Street Gallery featured a 5,000-square-foot grand salon covered in ornate drapery and offering comfortable seating where visitors could uh, take in the scu uh, sculptures, which were helpfully flattered by large mirrors on the walls reflecting the figures from every angle. Okay, you probably you've guessed who I'm describing now, Marie is actually none other than that incredibly successful artist and famous businesswoman, Madame Tussaud. Madame Tussaud's wax gallery became one of the first, one of the most popular locations in London. Visitors to the city would always arrange time for a tour. Madame Tussaud knew that the public then, as now, would go nuts for two things, royal fever and horror shows. <laughs> <laughs> and she gladly provided immersion in both. In February of 1840, Queen Victoria married her beloved husband, Prince Albert. The marriage inspired Madame Tussauds to put together a royal display, recreating Prince Albert sliding the ring on, queen, on the Queen's finger. In fact, Tussauds' royal connections garnered her uh, an exact duplicate of Queen Victoria's wedding dress to aliven the wax figures. The display was part of the Grand Gallery, where the tasteful exhibits were displayed. But there was also <laughs> the way you another said room. That. <laughs> Paused. <laughs> the official name of this room was the Chamber of Horrors, but polite society simply referred to it as the adjoining or other room. <laughs> the Chamber of Horrors played tribute to the French Revolution with a working scale model guillotine, and the heads of Louis the Sixteenth, Marie Antoinette, and Robespierre, the latter grimly squashed in to reflect his botched suicide attempt. Other displays in this room included an array of British murderers cast from life at their trials. Among them, James Rush, who was executed for the triple murder of his landlord and family. Also featured were William Burke and William Hare, who were known for committing murders and then selling the bodies to medical schools. Yeah, I have read about them. Yeah. Heard about oh, they, them. they were making good yeah, money. They, they probably were. were. Marie cast Burke's head three hours after his execution in 1829. Hare turned King's evidence and escaped the gallows, but he was modeled uh, by, uh, from life while he was still in prison by Tussauds' sons, who had by that time joined her in business. Some were critical of Tussauds' exhibits, claiming that they were vile and vulgar. Tussauds disagreed. 
Claiming that she was providing a great public service, she wrote, quote, Madame Tussaud, in offering this little work to the public, has endeavored to blend utility and amusement. The exhibit contains a general outline of the history of each character, which will not only increase the pleasure to be derived uh, from a mere view of the figure, but will also convey to the minds of young persons much biographical knowledge, a branch of education universally allowed to be of the highest importance. So she was uh, pretty high on the, on the service that she was providing. <laughs> well, Madame Tussaud died in 1850 at the age of 89 with the distinction of creating England's most popular tourist attraction. Her sons continued the operation after her death, and today, Madame Tussaud's Wax Museums is still going strong with more than 20 locations worldwide. Quite a legacy for an amazing woman. It really is. That is impressive. And this information came from Atlas Obscura as well as MadameTussauds.com. You can go right to their website and, and find where their locations are. And that's the way I heard it. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, don't sue us, Mike, please. Um, <laughs> well, the publicity would be great. But no. <laughs> have you ever, have you been to one of the wax museums? I have not been to one of them, no. Okay, I haven't either. Well, that's I, a I've first. Got a, it, it wasn't a Madame Tussaud, but I, I have a picture next to a wax Taylor Swift that we found on the... <laughs> actually, I think it was either right next to the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum or in the entryway. No, I was going to say in the, the in the Ripley Museum in San Antonio, they do have some of, I, I, I believe, some of Madame Tussaud's so. fig, wax figures there. A few of them. It's not yeah. the whole museum, but there are a few of her figures there that are on display. Well, now, in one of our episode, our previous episodes that we mentioned that you might want to partake of this creepy season or this spooky season yeah. is called Creepy. Uh, it's our season two, episode 23, where we talk about the Fox sisters. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Back in 1848, these sisters claimed that they could summon the dead to talk to them via a series of pops and cracking noises. Oh, yeah. They were asking questions. And uh, if you got one crack, it was yes. If you got two pops, two it was yeah. 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 That's right. Right. Well, they became a sensation in New York and in New England as large crowds of paying guests came to watch them interpret the spirits. After a few years, the sisters were renounced by an older sister as being phonies. <laughs> and I think there was money involved. Yeah. 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 Somebody's feelings were hurt. Yeah. yeah. And it turns out that the pops and cracks that accompanied their performances were actually being created by their toe knuckles. That's pretty good. Uh, uh, you know, if you can make a toe knuckle pop crack that's that loud that people are going to hear you in the theater, that's a good skill right there. I could bet good money that at least one of my kids could do that. <laughs> 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 Nevertheless, the Fox sisters set off a wave of interest in spiritualism in the United States. That's kind of where it, it, the yeah, whole it craze started. began. Uh, the spiritualism craze gave rise to mediums and spiritualists throughout the country, as well as charlatans who saw an opportunity to make a quick buck. Definitely. And, mm -hmm. then, um, and then I think it spread from there over across the pond. Yeah. Uh, the onset of the Civil War fueled further interest in making contact with the dead as thousands of citizens lost family members in the conflict. Mm -hmm. Even First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln held a seance in the White House after the death of their 11-year-old son. Right. And I think we've talked about that in some episode before. Yeah. The interest was so great that people began to complain that it took too long to get an appointment with a medium. <laughs> there was a, a long line, yeah. a waiting list. Uh, what was needed was a shortcut way to contact the dead without going through a spiritualist, kind of right. cut out the, the middleman. If we could only find a way to get to them directly. <laughs> right. And uh, capitalism rises <laughs> to the challenge. Yes. <laughs> Enter the Canard Novelty Company. Dun, dun, dun. In 1886, the Associated Press reported on a new phenomenon taking over the spiritualist camps in Ohio, the talking board. Okay. <laughs> Charles Kennard of Baltimore, Maryland, decided to jump on the opportunity. He pulled together a group of four other investors to start the Kennard Novel Novelty Company to exclusively make and market these new talking boards. Okay, the boards didn't actually talk, but they displayed the letters of the alphabet and mm -hmm. numbers from zero to nine. And then I'm sure you know what this looks like. It's a plan. And then... A planchet, which yeah. is a handheld device, which pointed out the answers. None of these men were spiritualists, really, but they were all keen businessmen, and they didn't identified a trend or a niche. However, they didn't know what to call it. Yeah, <laughs> it, didn't have, it didn't have a name already. Yeah. So the Canard talking board was tried at first, but it lacked flair. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> According to the notes from that first meeting, the investors decided to ask the board itself. <laughs> what it should be called. <laughs> and right, prototype weird board. What are you going to call yourself? Yeah. And the planchette spelled out Ouija, Ouija yeah. which said it meant good luck. 
And it's, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder which marketing assistant in there really pushed it to, yeah. to what he wanted. Anyway, contrary to popular belief, Ouija is not a combination for the French word yes, we, oui, and the German ja. Ja. This is, but maybe this story is true, maybe not. It's also known that the sister of one of the major investors was a great admirer of women's activists named Ouida. Perhaps Ouija or Ouija came from a misunderstanding of that name. Yeah, that's a that's the theory, the theory. I saw that. One more hurdle remained, the U.S. Patent Office. There, the chief patent officer demanded a demonstration. If the, <laughs> <laughs> if the board could accurately spell out his name, which was supposed to be unknown, He'd allow the patent application to proceed. Oh. <laughs> uh, the board performed well <laughs> and spelled out the name of the patent officer. It just so happened that one of the Canard Company executives knew the man's first name and possibly helped spell it. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, that demonstration was sufficient enough to convince the patent officer. Uh, and the patent was issued and Canard and Company began raking in the dough. Yeah. Their spiritualism. By 1892, the Canard Novelty Company grew from one factory in Baltimore to two in Baltimore, two in New York, two in Chicago, and one in London. Oh, wow. They were pumping them out, weren't That's they? That's right. Sales were booming as the idea of, quote, skip the medium to cold. <laughs> <laughs> medium and spiritualists were not in favor of the new shortcut because it deeply cut into their bottom line. <laughs> Ouija stayed on the fringe of American culture, parentally popular, mysterious, interesting, and usually non-threatening. That is until 1973. In that year, a movie came out called The Exorcist. <laughs> and it scared the pants off of people. Uh, yeah. in, in the story, a 12-year-old girl, if you haven't seen this, named Reagan, was possessed by a demon after she was playing with a Ouija board by herself. This changed how people saw the board. Before The Exorcist, film and TV depictions of the Ouija board were usually hokey and joking yeah. and silly. I Love Lucy, for example, featured a 1951 episode in which Lucy and Ethel host a seance using the Ouija board. I remember that board. episode. I remember seeing that. It's hilarious. I don't, I don't remember that one, but I'm <laughs> sure it's hilarious. But after The Exorcist, though, the Ouija board became a tool of the devil and, for that reason, a tool of horror writers and, and movie makers. Right. The following year saw the Ouija board denounced by religious groups as Satan's preferred method of communication. <laughs> right. Christian religious groups still may remain wary of the board, citing scripture denouncing communication with spirits through mediums. Catholic.com calls the Ouija board, quote, far from harmless. Mm. But the real question, the one everyone wants to know, is how do Ouija boards work? Well, according to researchers, Ouija boards are not powered by spirits or even demons. I know that's... Shocking. Yeah. They are powered by us, even when we protest that we're not doing it. But really, I didn't do it. Ouija <laughs> boards work on a principle known as the ideometer effect. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, I think that's right. Ideometer effect. In short, these are automatic muscular movements that take place without conscious will. So in other words, as you move the planchet around the board, your subconscious brain triggers a slight tremor that your conscious brain detects as coming from somewhere outside of your own being. Mm -hmm. You might believe that it's coming to you from a different realm, but it actually came from within yourself. I wish I could vacuum the house that way. <laughs> Just turn off the brain. Yeah. Right. Unconscious. Dr. Chris French, a professor of psychology at Goldsmiths University in London states, quote, it can generate a very strong impression that the movement is being caused by some outside agency. But it's not, unquote. Mm -hmm. Some researchers are using the Ouija board in tests to attempt to learn more about the ideometer effect and how it may be used in medical research. <laughs> yeah. The, the, uh, the article I saw went into a lot more detail than we had. It was pretty interesting that we would really have time to cover here. But, yeah, it, it looked like there was some interesting stuff there. In spite of this scientific explanation, Ouija boards remain big sellers and continue to show up in popular movies and TV shows. The Canard Novelty Company was purchased by Parker Brothers, which was later purchased by Hasbro. They continue to manufacture a variety of Ouija boards. They say that sales often tick up in times of uncertainty, such as the recent pandemic. Uh, right. Ima evidently, people are looking for something to believe in. Can you yeah. imagine sitting around in the pandemic? <laughs> well, kids, let's. <laughs> <laughs> this information came from Smithsonian.com. Well, back when I was a kid... One of my favorite possessions was a Sony AM transistor radio. 
I spent many a happy night sitting in my backyard under a starry Texas sky listening to the music, baseball games, and other interesting content on that radio. Earlier this year, in our Season 5, Episode 8, titled Edison and Tesla, we talked about the Tesla coil, which enables radio communications. Well, that Sony must have had a very good Tesla coil, because I could pick up signals from stations as far away as Chicago, all the way down here in Texas. Uh, However, the quality of the AM signal can appear to be a bit eerie as it fades in and out from time to time. You can have a clear signal, and then it fades out, and it can be replaced by a static or even a strange tone, which seems to increase and then decrease. Kind of like that. (laughs) Well, at the same time I was listening to my radio in Texas, some people in England were listening to theirs also, but they were picking up something entirely different. From allthatsinteresting.com, we learned that at the height of the Cold War, many radio listeners accidentally stumbled into some rather unnerving programming. These creepy broadcasts would typically begin with a strange melody or several beeps and were followed by the voice of a woman or a child reciting seemingly random numbers. Yeah. Okay, I've got one that you can find them on YouTube. I've got one pulled up here on my phone. Let's I've see heard of these. So that's just kind of the way it goes, just random numbers, and sometimes there's names and, and uh, you know, just repeated in a pattern like that. Uh, these transmissions played routinely and lasted for several minutes on frequencies that listeners dubbed numbers stations. The phenomenon spawned a fringe group of radio listeners dedicated to solving the mystery of who was sending these broadcasts and why. The most prevalent theory among the amateur sleuths tracking these number stations is that the mysterious broadcasts were actually coded messages used in espionage operations across the globe. This explanation appears to make sense according to a writer named Nigel West who specializes in espionage uh, uh, research. Quoting Nigel, Nobody has found a more convenient and expedient way of communicating with an agent in denied areas, a territory, where it is difficult to use a conventional form of communication. He maintains that the broadcasts are coded messages to spies. One station, known as The Buzzer, has been sending out mysterious broadcasts since the Cold War. It features two buzzes at the top of every hour, followed by a monotonous drone between the 21st and 34th minute during daylight hours. A voice follows, reading a string of numbers, words, or names in Russian, like Anna, Nikolai, Ivan, Tatiana, or Roman. It was initially believed that the broadcast was set up by the old Soviet Union, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the strange radio broadcasts only became more active, and they are still going on today. And still, there's been no official explanation about the eerie numbers stations. Again, this came from allthatsinteresting.com. Yeah, that that just gives me, takes me right back to all the Cold War yeah. Existential dread. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we, we watched a documentary on Putin not too long ago, and he, he's kind of trying to return Russia to that time, so maybe that's why it's still going on. Goodness. <laughs> well, now the ancient Romans had a saying, memento mori, and we've talked about that yeah. here before, uh, and translated it means, remember, you must die. While most of us are trying to prolong life and postpone death as long as we can, we all must face that final certainty. Mm-hmm. And for some people, reaching the point of death is a good time to unburden themselves of dark secrets that they may have been carrying around for years. Yeah. Known as deathbed confessions, these final statements may be made to clear their conscience or perhaps to benefit those left behind. And from listverse.com, we find some interesting deathbed confessions. Well, let's begin with the case of Naaman Diller. Let's just enjoy that name for a second, Naaman Diller. Any relation to Phyllis? I was what I was wondering too. <laughs> I didn't I even know wondering. you knew who Phyllis Diller was. I know her from yeah. the Muppet Show that we used to okay. watch. A lot right, of <laughs> she was a comedian back in actress and comedian back in the '60s and '70s. That, that's but I don't think there's a connection people. here. Yeah. Anyway, in 1983, the costliest theft in Israel's history saw 106 timepieces worth millions of dollars disappear from a Jerusalem museum. Included in the timepiece was a pocket watch made for Marie Antoinette. Hey, she's shown up twice in this show. What do you know? Uh, It was valued at more than $30 million. The case remained unsolved for more than 20 years. Then in 2006, a Tel Aviv jeweler informed local police that he had purchased a collection of 40 watches from an anonymous individual through a lawyer intermediary. 
Many of the watches in the collection were from the 1983 heist. The investigation led police to a woman in Los Angeles named Nilly Shamrat. Upon further investigation, it was discovered that Nilly Shamrat was the widow of a recently deceased man named Naaman Diller. Israel police, uh, Israeli police recognized that name as a prominent burglar from the 1960s. A search of Shamrat's home turned up more uh, missing watches, including the Marie Antoinette watch. Oh, wow. Evidently, on his deathbed, Naaman Diller had confessed to his wife that he stole the watches in the 1983 heist. He gave her directions as to how to locate the watches and that she should try to sell them if she needed money. The <laughs> wife was not arrested, but the watches were returned to the Jerusalem Museum. Interesting. Interesting. Now, we're going way back in time for this one. And, in fact, we're not really certain that this person actually existed. But, well, you know, <laughs> well, legend has it. Don't let the facts it. get in the way of a good story. That's it's what we totally always a good say story. Right legend has it <laughs> that Bjorn Ironside, who was supposedly a Viking king, ruled in what is now Sweden sometime in the 9th century A.D. Yeah, I like the name Bjorn Ironside. Mm. Uh, right? I, I wonder if he picked it himself. Yeah. <laughs> um, he also doubled as a raider and frequently organized surprise attacks into cities in Europe and North Africa. One of his most infamous raids occurred when he partnered with another Viking called Hastein to attack the Italian city of Luni, which they mistook for Rome. <laughs> <laughs> the raid started with a siege. However, the duo quickly realized that the city was well defended against an assault, so they decided to trick their way in. Hastein, or Hastein, uh, sent a message to the priest of Luni claiming that Bjorn was near death and had requested a Christian burial. The, f the priest agreed and allowed some Viking pallbearers to carry Bjorn's body into Luni. Once there, Bjorn leapt out of the coffin and fought his way to the city gates alongside the Viking soldiers disguised as pallbearers. <laughs> <laughs> However, they soon realized that they attacked, had attacked the wrong city. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Oops. My bad, said Bjorn. <laughs> Sorry, you're not I, wrong. I wonder, okay, I've not even heard of Luni. You know, you would think you would know what Rome looks like. You know, it's pretty well. And maybe, I mean, it's L U N I. Maybe where it maybe it's something. Yeah, I don't know. I have to look and see where that one is. Now, I'm guessing that most everyone has at one time or another seen the famous 1934 black and white photograph that is purported to be the Loch Ness monster. Absolutely. This photo came about because a number of sightings had been reported of the so called monster. A London newspaper called the Daily Mail hired a local hunter named Marmaduke Wetherell. There's another nice. name we can enjoy. <laughs> Marmaduke Wetherell to investigate the claims. Wetherell found some large tracks leading to the lake that he proudly displayed to the press. But when the Natural History Museum investigated, they quickly discovered that the footprints were a hoax. Wetherell was humiliated when the newspaper reported this and for being fooled by the prank. What happened next remained a secret, though, for the next 60 years. Oh, Wetherell convinced his stepson, Christian Sperling, to help him create a model that would fool the public. Sperling was a professional model builder. He started with a toy submarine, and then he added a long neck and a small head. The submarine would putter along below the surface with the neck part sticking out about a foot above. Wetherell then went down to the lake and took some pictures of the, quote, monster. To add respectability to the hoax, he convinced an acquaintance named Dr. Wilson to develop the photos and sell it to the Daily Mail. So that took him out of it. For decades, this photo was considered to be the best evidence of the existence of the Loch Ness Monster. In 1994, at the age of 93 and near death, Christian Sperling confessed that the photo taken 60 years ago was indeed a hoax conjured up by his stepfather. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now, here's an interesting deathbed confession with a twist. Ooh. In 1977, James Brewer was arrested in Tennessee on suspicion of killing his neighbor in a fit of jealous rage. Brewer jumped bail and fled to Oklahoma, where he and his wife began a new life together under the names Michael and Dorothy Anderson. They joined a church and had children, like you do. When you're on the run. <laughs> <laughs> Good cover. Uh, she, in, even, in the she even taught a Bible class at church. Three decades went by. Then in 2009, Brewer had a serious stroke, and before dying, he felt compelled to confess the crime that had weighed on his conscience for over three decades. His wife then called the police department to the, uh, to the hospital, saying that her husband wanted to confess to a murder. Brewer confessed to his crime with the help of his wife, who had to translate... <laughs> 
I don't think the wife helped in the murder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she helped. She had to translate due to the effects of the stroke. Right. The police took down the information and contacted authorities in Tennessee. It was assumed that the case would be closed upon Brewer's death. But, <laughs> and there was a problem, he didn't die. He experienced a miraculous recovery. And seeing that his wife was an accomplice to his escape, but both Brewer and his wife were arrested and returned to Tennessee. He is still serving time there today. Oh, <laughs> oh. I take it back. I take it back. Well, another strange case kind of similar to that comes to us from New Zealand. In 2018, a cancer patient told his doctor that he had uh, had some confessions to make. He added that he would only disclose the information on the condition that the doctor promised never to tell anyone else. The doctor agreed. The man identified only with the pseudonym Sean claimed that he had been a gun for hire who was responsible for several murders across New Zealand in the 1960s. Boy, you don't think of New Zealand as being a gun for hire kind of a place, do you? Anyway, the doctor kept his secret. However, several medical and law researchers figured out who Sean was. This generated a controversy that split medical practitioners into two groups. One supported the doctor who kept the secret, while the others wanted the doctor to reveal it. The situation became more complicated when Sean recovered unexpectedly and was actually released from the hospital to a nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> right? And and before any, you know, if somebody goes, can I tell you something, but you got to promise not to tell, like, just don't. Just say no, no, find somebody else. Well, this final deathbed confession has a Hollywood connection. William Desmond Taylor was an actor and a top U.S. film director of silent films in the early days of Hollywood. Yeah. When Taylor was shot to death in 1922, it became one of Hollywood's most famous scandals and mysteries. Forty-two years later in 1964, an obscure old woman who was living in the Hollywood Hills began having chest pains and summoned her friend who lived next door. The friend was away, but her son came to help, and the chest pains began to increase. It was looking like the end was near. She had asked for a priest to come, but he hadn't arrived yet, so she began confessing to her neighbor's son. Uh oh. As she was dying on her kitchen floor, she said she was a silent film actress by the name of Margaret Gibson, and that she shot and killed a man named William Desmond Taylor. She is alleged to have been involved romantically with Taylor, but a motive as to why she killed him was never mentioned. Taylor's murder remains officially unsolved. However, the one thing that stands out is that Gibson had absolutely nothing to gain by her confession. Mm -hmm. You can see Gibson and Taylor perform in a short, silent movie called The Kiss. Yeah, it's only about a nine-minute movie. I watched a little bit of it, but you, know, you could see it. So you can find it on YouTube? Yeah, find it on YouTube. Yeah. In an interesting side note, the terrific 1950 classic film noir pick Sunset Boulevard. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. It's a great movie. <laughs> pays homage to Taylor in the leading character's name, Nora Desmond. It's yeah. taken from Taylor's middle name of Desmond and one of his actor's friends, Mabel Normand. That's one where she stands up and says, I'm ready for my close-up now, Mr. DeMille. You know, after she'd already, she murders. <laughs> the, show, the great line from that movie, this young man meets her. And she's aging by that time. He says, I know who you are. You're Nora Desmond. You used to be big. And she says, I'm still big. It's the pictures that got small. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and again, this info all came from listverse.com. Well, in our final eerie story, we're going to talk about a coincidence that has gained traction to have its own meaning. Uh, in two short years, spanning July 3rd, 1969 and July 3rd, 1971, the music world lost four of its most popular performers. Mm -hmm. mm. Brian Jones, one of the founders and lead guitarists of the Rolling Stones, drowned mysteriously on July 3rd, 1969. Then on September 18, 1970, the great guitarist Jimi Hendrix died from complications of a drug overdose. Just two weeks later, Janis Joplin also died of a drug overdose. Then the following July 3rd, Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The, uh, of the Doors, died of heart failure, likely related to drug use as well. Though these deaths occurred in different locations, there is one thing that they have in common. All four performers were 27 years old at the time of their death. The right. fact that these performers died at age 27 came to be and remains a perennial subject of popular culture, uh, cultural lore. Dubbed the 27 Club, these deaths gave rise to an urban myth that celebrity pass, uh, passings are more common at the age of 27. Is there any truth to this myth? Well, Wikipedia includes a list of more than 60 young performers that died at age 27. Oh, wow. Since those original four. 
Now, not all of these were musicians. Some were actors, athletes, and other personalities, including Pat Tillman, who was a football player who joined the Army and died from a friendly fire incident in Iraq. Very sad story. Right. Most of those named on the list were minor celebrities, but nevertheless, it's an impressive list, which lends to the belief that young entertainers are more likely to die at the age of 27. So is there any truth to this? Well, a British study examined the death age of over a thousand musicians and performers in order to determine if there was any truth to the myth. They found a slight uptick in the number of deaths at the age of 27, but an equal uptick at ages 25 and 32. Moreover, they found a higher spike in the number of death mu uh, musicians at the age of 56. <laughs> That's still young. Yeah. They concluded that there was no evidence to suggest that young entertainers are more likely to die at age 27. Still, the urban myth of the 27 Club prevails. Yeah, don't let logic get in the way. Right. And according to Wikipedia, the myth really took off after the 1994 death of Kurt Cobain, who took his life just a month after turning 27. In his hometown of Aberdeen, Washington, Cobain's mother told a local newspaper, quote, Now he's gone and joined that stupid club. I told him not to join that stupid club. <laughs> oh, that, I want to laugh at that, but that's sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is so sad. It's been suggested that, he may, uh, that there may be an element of uh, self-fulfilling prophecy sure. about the 27 Club. In fact, some have even suggested that Cobain timed his death in order to join the 27 Club. However, his biographer Charles Cross dismissed the idea, noting that Cobain, Cobain had numerous drug overdoses and suicide attempts in the years prior to his death. Then in 2011, attention to the 27 Club was rekindled again when singer-songwriter mm -hmm. Amy Winehouse died of alcohol poisoning. Two years prior, she had told her assistant that she was afraid she would, quote, join the club. Wow. A statement from the British study mentioned earlier makes an appropriate summation of this topic. Quote, fame may increase the risk of death among musicians, but this risk is not limited to the age 27. Mm. The information came from the National Library of Medicine and also from Wikipedia. And we certainly hope that you've enjoyed this eerie episode. That's right. Happy Halloween. Phil here reminding you to check out our Facebook and Instagram pages at Remnant Stew Podcast. Drop us an email at staycurious at remnantstew.com just to say hi or to let us know about any topics you would like to hear us cover in an upcoming episode. Remnant Stew is a part of Rook and Raven Ventures and is created by me, Leah Lamp. Steve Meeker researches and writes each episode that we then host together. Our audio producer is Philip Sinkfeld. The Audity Du Jour is brought to you by Sam Lamp. Theme music is by Kevin McLeod with voiceover by Morgan Hughes. Special thanks goes out to Judy Meeker. Yay. For a complete list of so sources for this episode, please see the episode's transcript, and there's a link to it in the show notes. Now, before you go, please hit the follow button so you won't miss an episode. Head on over to Apple Music and leave us a review. Oh, we love reading those reviews. Share Remnant Stew with your friend, your family, Madame Tussaud and Bjorn Ironsides, and whoever else you might run into. Until next time, remember to choose to be kind and, and always stay curious. curious. October is the official spooky month of the season. Or, I'm sorry. I like spooky month of the season. That's spooky good. month of the season. Yeah. In the town of Belleville, Missouri, you can't ask for Halloween. Or, <laughs> I could say the name, but not the sentence.